Joker 2 or Joker Folly or Do is a bad movie. But I don't think it's like a bad movie that is like so bad it's good. And I don't think it's actually terrible. I don't think it's the worst movie I've ever seen. I think that there's a lot of exaggerations going around about that. I didn't feel at any point really like I wanted to walk out of this movie. Now, at the same time, it was sort of the car crash mentality that things were not going the way that pretty much anybody wanted this movie to go. Now, everyone's got different perspectives. Your idea of how Joker 2 would be would be different than how I would envision the film. But I don't think anybody really thought that this was going to be the finished product of Joker 2 or Folly Do. Even that name just sounds ridiculous. It doesn't even sound like that would be the name of this movie, the subtitle. Joker 2 would have been fine, or, you know, Joker, the next laugh. Something along those lines would have been fine, but Folly or Do, like a French title, just sounds a little ridiculous. You already know what you're getting yourself into. But there are some redeemable elements to this film. And it's a movie that tries to do something that's never fully realized. Its concept is never fully brought to fruition. I don't think that Todd Phillips really had this in the oven long enough. Now, I know you might be saying he had it in there for five years, but he really didn't. Because the way how this movie came about is Joaquin Phoenix had a dream. He had a dream. No, not like Martin Luther King he actually had a real dream. Like, he dreamt it, this movie. Now, I would have never heard of, like, an actor going to sleep and thinking of, like, a superhero or supervillain movie. I've never heard that before. But, you know, like, I never heard of, say, um, Christian Bale going to sleep and, and he dreamt of Batman. Just sounds ridiculous uh, i don't know i just i'm not really buying it so much so uh, both of them phillips and phoenix did not want to do this movie they were they weren't it was out of the question i remember as soon as the first movie came out it was standalone that was it that was the end of it and i was like all right you know this movie, as a standalone film, it pretty much does everything it needs to do. It tells a story, it tells a good story, it tells a depressing story. And quite frankly, I have to say, when it came to the first Joker movie, I enjoyed it, I liked it, it was a good film, but it was very emotionally draining. And I did not want to see the film again. The last time I saw the film was in theaters in 2019. So I really did not have a desire to go back and watch it, even in preparation for this new film. Especially when I started hearing how bad it is. And many people will know that I have different opinions when it comes to movies, I have different opinions when it comes to video games, I have different opinions than most when it comes to basically everything, you know? I myself feel like an outcast at times, like the Joker, when it comes to my opinions on things. A lot of times I disagree with the critics and the fans of certain franchises. And, you know, that's just come to be expected. You know, I'm a unique person, and I don't really feel guilty when I, you know, dislike or like something that people feel otherwise about. So, this film, it was sus to begin with. You know, I mean, there was no test screenings, and during the opening weekend, Todd Phillips is secluded on his ranch. So, you know, you already know that he knew that this was not going to be a popular film, or it didn't go to his liking, and that's okay. You know, a lot of movies don't go the way that directors wanted them to go. Like Jurassic Park, Lost World, didn't go the way Steven Spielberg wanted it to go. He wasn't entirely happy with that film. So sometimes directors don't always hit the mark. 
And it's safe to say that Todd Phillips did not hit the mark when it came to Joker 2, and that's putting it mildly. So, this movie is not a good one, but I don't think it's the Titanic Hindenburg level disaster that everybody's talking about. There are some things in this movie that are good, and there's a lot of things in it that are very questionable and bad, and, you know, I think there was a much different vision in mind for this film, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. So, first things first, before we get to all the other stuff that's a bit more complex, talk about the simple stuff first, like Joaquin Phoenix and Lady Gaga. So, obviously, Joaquin Phoenix is playing Arthur Fleck, and uh, Lady Gaga is playing Harley Quinn. And, you know, uh, Lady Gaga is actually pretty good. I think she plays the role of a weirdo quite well. I, I think that, you know, Joaquin Phoenix get, does a fantastic performance, much like he did in the first film. I think Lady Gaga adds a certain element to this film that is quite positive. And I think a lot of people don't want me to say that. A lot of people... You know, I but I've seen a lot of people who really hate this film, despise this film to the bitter end to its very core and the fiber of its being. They probably want to take, you know, every file or film reel of this thing and smash it to pieces. But even those people are saying that Lady Gaga is actually pretty good in this film. And she is. I think the performance is good, and I think that they have a lot of chemistry together. Now Cinematography, it's not a bit more complex, but not like really. Cinematography is really good too. I think there's some very good shots, especially in the prison. I think that there is like some really good artistic shots being done. And I, I think it's a good looking film. I think we could all agree on that. Nice shots, nice angles. It sets a, a mood. There's grittiness. It's a, it is a great looking film. And I think that the film just overall in tone, just the way how it's, you know, directed and written, I think that it sets a really good tone. Now, something that this movie doesn't do well is its pacing. It is a horrible pace, to say the least. Lots of talking to the guards and just futzing around. And it's mostly about, like, Arthur Fleck's prison life. And it's really very boring in a lot of parts but you know it's kind of weird because it's not so boring you know like boring boring but it's just kind of slow and doesn't really get to where it needs to go at a sufficient pace so there's a big time problem there so you know, it eventually works its way towards the trial because Arthur is about to be put on trial um, for the crimes he committed in the first movie. And the other thing that is a big point of controversy here, and how do I feel about it? It's about this movie being a musical. And the songs aren't bad. They're actually well done, but there's too many of them. And they're not that great. You know, like, they're they're well done, meaning they're well performed. Lady Gaga, though, like, I would kind of expect it to be a little bit better. You know, I'm not a massive Lady Gaga fan, but I will say that her first two albums, the, the Fame and the Fame Monster, those are masterpieces. I really do like those albums a lot, but everything after that, I am not a Lady Gaga fan because I really just only like those two albums from her. And the Fame Monster is more like an EP, so. But we're not here to talk about Lady Gaga music, we're here to talk about Joker 2. And, you know, this is like, it's not really a musical, there's songs in it, it's not really a full-on musical. It's definitely a partial musical with drama and some dark comedy mixed in. But it's definitely not a musical. And, you know, there's a lot of moments where they cut away from reality. And that's something that happens in this movie that's very interesting. And they did this in the first movie with um, Arthur's neighbor, who you do see uh, during the trial when they uh, cross-examine her. And 
that's going between reality and going into his fantasy and his delusions and that happens with Harley. Uh, so there was that one point where he gets tossed into solitary when he meets Harley and they escape momentarily together and Harley comes in uh, with him and they actually uh, have sex together. And, and obviously that's not really happening. That's playing into his delusions. So, you know, that's a, a nice element too. I do like that. It plays into the psychosis of Arthur and the character. Now, the one thing getting back to the, the music, it's really annoying that during key moments that a song comes on, it's just very jarring at times. Like, oh, another song? Like, you know, it, it and it doesn't always fit I mean, you could see what they were going for here. I mean, I get the idea that it's sort of like a dark comedy, as I mentioned before. And, you know, it's an interesting idea that a, a character as colorful as the Joker and as offbeat as him would have like these upbeat songs, uh, like transitioning from all these kind of very, um, you know, moody moments. And like, you know, we're in a very grimy atmosphere. We're in a prison you know, for most of the movie. So it doesn't really like fit, but it's like ironic because, you know, you've got these songs playing, you know, from the the 1950s and they're like swing songs, you know, and there's references to Fred Astaire and stuff like that. So it's kind of like, oh, that's ironic. And in a way, you know, I could see what you know, Phillips was going for here, make it a little unsettling, you know, it's like, you know, when something's like overly cheery, you know, and it's set in a, like with a dark vibe behind it, it makes things like, ooh, what's going on here? But it doesn't work overall. That's the problem. And it, it, it is an interesting idea. It's an idea that I could sort of get behind, like a dark musical comedy drama you know, based in this world, but overall it falls flat on its face and it just does not work. So one of the best parts of this movie and probably the best part is where Arthur decides to represent himself in the court scene. And he, he's actually doing like a Southern lawyer impression. You know, he's doing this with his suit and he's, it's basically, Henry Drummond from Inherit the Wind. And he cross-examines Gary Puddles, the little person from the first movie. And it seems like he has like a, a change of heart. You know, he sees his friend heartbroken by his actions. And he says that, you know, Arthur was the only person that treated him kindly. And it's a very tearful moment. And Arthur kind of gets, you know, um, he, he says, like, no more questions, Your Honor. He doesn't even want to cross-examine Gary anymore. So, you know, there's a little bit of feels right there. Just a little bit of feels, but it's not really, like, that. that's it. That's all we're getting. You know, that is a good moment, but, like, if that's it for Arthur representing himself and he's dressed up as the Joker and seeing him in the courtroom and doing all this, it's fun hijinks, but we needed this and we needed it for the full two plus hours that you give us. This movie is way too long for giving us so little Joker. Joker's barely on screen in this movie. You know, and I've said this time and time again, if you cannot tell an efficient story in over two fucking hours, then you don't deserve to have your movie be this long. You, you know, this is something that I really appreciate with 80s movies. Now, don't get me wrong. I know there's a lot of movies. One of my favorite movies of all time, as a matter of fact, Another 48 Hours, a great Eddie Murphy movie, was notoriously chopped down by the film studio. You know, and it, it kind of, it, it's still a great film, still one of my favorite movies of all time, but it's something that did not get upheld to the director's vision and, and maybe maybe the studio did him a favor and maybe his movie was very bloated but I, I don't know but they used to sometimes really chop these movies down to a nice 
90 minutes and I miss 90 minute movies. I really do. I wish more movies were 90 minutes, but they are not. So uh, we see in a very disturbing scene that Arthur is beaten by the guards because he calls them fat, makes fun of them as you know he's doing his defense. And he's actually R-worded in the showers of the prison. And it seems like it breaks him. He's later found guilty. He gets rescued by some of the adoring public. Um, and then he's dumped by Harley. And then he's killed by another inmate who's supposed to be the real Joker. And he like cuts his mouth, you know, uh, a la Heath Ledger. So uh, he's not even the real Joker. So Joker is beaten down, he's broken, and uh, the thing is, what people have been saying, what, was this done purposely to demean the character? You know, what was Todd Phillips doing in this film? Did he purposely fuck this movie up? Did he make this movie bad on purpose? Well, that is an interesting question, and it's uh, something that deserves an interesting answer. So the way that I see it is this. Todd Phillips, he didn't like how the original film resonated with certain people that feel like outcasts. And while that might sound a bit odd, uh, you know, this movie, it, it actually just, it, it connected with them. It made them feel okay to feel validated. Say, you know, you have a mental illness and you're aware of it and you're getting treatment for it and you feel like you don't belong in society, or maybe just in general. You know, people like uh, said that this was resonating with all the wrong people. There were a lot of, you know, political commentators talking about this movie, you know, uh, specifically referring to, uh, to these people as incels. And, you know, I don't know if there's any proof of that connection, but, I don't know. For anybody, I wouldn't say that, you know, the first Joker movie should be a source of encouragement. But it did do something very positive that I did like, and this might be a little bit obscure, but it did kind of put a mainstream spotlight on men's health, and this is something that's very overlooked in society, because, you know, men are big, tough, and strong, and we're protectors, and we're providers. So, you know, a lot of times, we kind of disregard or overlook this and we don't realize that not all men are well we have issues we have problems we go through things just like anybody else in society so i don't know why that why things are like that way but that's kind of how i feel that's because they feel like men are invincible we're tough we're strong many men are not in tune with their feelings and they don't say how they're feeling most of the time and you know, I think men can do a little bit better when it comes to that. But, you know, overall, it is something that should be talked about a lot more. And this movie sort of did that in its own way. And, you know, unfortunately, it's about a supervillain, so it might not go over so well. So I think what Phillips was trying to do here, it's trying to show that, you know, somebody like this, he's being held as a martyr in society. You know, and he wanted to show, like, this is not somebody you should look up to. So what he did is, he took Arthur, or the Joker, down a peg. And you could see that during the cross-examination. He has sort of, like, a reawakening. And he finds out that Harley was not, like, committed to the institution at Arkham that she actually checked herself in. So she's sort of fraudulent. She's not as crazy as she made herself out to be, even though she sort of is. And, you know, uh, this is the thing. It's kind of like he realizes that he can't live this life. And there is something to be said about that. Like, he realizes, like, the Joker's not me. He kind of realized he made a mistake. It's kind of remorseful. But when you're a character like the Joker, you shouldn't be remorseful. The things that he did and even how the movie's like leading up to the court scene, it, it, it should be like, you kind of feel like Arthur is just going through the motions and trying to blame it on his mental illness because that is how he's going to basically 
you know, get around the death penalty. I was not going to face major consequences. But they take that out of the story and they make like Arthur is, you know, uh, like he just can't do this. You know, it's not even like he's going to try to deceive people anymore. So that undercurrent is totally removed because there's sort of a, a redemption that actually never gets fully realized. So it's actually kind of weird. It's like he's redeeming himself, but there's no payoff, really. He ends up dead. So there, it's kind of like, I guess it's too late for him, kind of, that he realizes the, you know, um, that he's going down a dark path and he tries to kind of put the brakes on at the last minute. That's kind of how I looked at it. So, but I don't think that the lies of Harley and Gary Puddles, that's not enough of a catalyst to have this guy change his whole mentality on life and the way he's doing things. You know, in 15 songs and all this shit, that's going on it, it, you know if they wanted to have this redemption arc then maybe they should have did a better job telling that story instead of having him fucking singing every 10 minutes in this movie you know like maybe it should have been a little bit more focused maybe that's what they should have done instead of doing all sorts of things and trying to make it a musical it's like be focused just do one thing. Don't try to be a jack of all trades and a master of none, because that's exactly what happened in this film. It ended up not being a master of anything. It, it actually ended up being a master of disaster. And even though it's a little bit overblown, the movie's not that bad, I still don't think that this movie is that great. And I think it is a bad movie. Like I said, there are certain things in this film that are good, and there's a lot of interesting concepts floating around, but nothing is realized to fruition. And that is the problem with Joker 2, or Joker Folly Ado. So guys, let me know what you think down in the comments below. Subscribe, click the bell. I've got a Patreon, which I would greatly appreciate any donations to. And thanks again, guys, for watching. I'll see you next time.